exciting program, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, first, a few things and announcements before I introduce our speaker. Um, this particular night is being co-sponsored by the Milburn Library, so I'd like to thank Mike Bannock and the Milburn Free Public Library for their support. And I'd also like to thank John McLaughlin for creating this club. John, why don't you stand up so the people can... Yay! Without him, this would not be. Um, I'd like to thank Carl Mink from uh, Milburn Camera for doing the videotaping. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'd like to make an announcement. We have a fundraiser. To put these programs on requires capital, and so to gain capital money, uh, Dr. Stephen Lamazzo has a collection of periodicals and magazines that is just beyond incredible. It, it, it's better than most museums in the country. Uh, this collection will be part of what he's showing uh, actually, you can see the whole collection in his house on June 18th. I have a book that he has published that shows part of that collection, and you're free to look through it. Uh, I think you'll find it amazing. The funds go to benefit the club. The cost is $100 per person. Uh, it includes a copy of the book as well as a wine and cheese afterwards, so if you can make that. And I'd just like to take a minute to introduce Robert Wolf, a World War II vet who wants to talk about the uh, New Orleans somebody wanna let them in, uh, museum. So, Mr. Wolf. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well I'm really I'm really grateful for the opportunity to bring a little New Orleans to you all. Have I got it right now? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the National World War II Museum, uh, why it's where it is, uh, what it is, and uh, what, we're, what we now are doing. Uh, it's in there. People ask, why is it in New Orleans? And one of the last foreign countries left in the United States. Uh, how many of you have been to the, to the museum? It's always nice to talk to the choir. Um, well, uh, it, is the, it, was the, it was the it was the it was the brainchild of of Stephen Ambrose, who was an author of a number of, of D-Day books. I'm sure you're familiar with, and was a professor at the University of New Orleans. And he put together a group of people in New Orleans to raise some money to build a D-Day museum. And in fact, on June 6, 2000 we opened uh, the D-Day Museum in New Orleans, having, having, some of us had no idea what it was going to become. Anyhow, uh, among the people who were there that day were uh, two important ones, Senator Inouye of Hawaii and Senator Stevens of Alaska, both veterans, and it occurred to them that this was a, this was a good operation and they went to the Congress and over a period of several years uh, they lobbied the Congress and we were designated the National World War II Museum uh, in 2004. And with that came an earmark of $50 million, uh, our, first and our first and last subsidy from the federal government. We, we, received, no op we received no operating funds from the federal government. Uh, we're, all, we're completely uh, privately funded. But anyhow, this $50 million was a kernel of a $325 million expansion. Uh, the exhibit space will be uh, expanded by over four times. I think we will probably have more exhibit space uh, when this uh, uh, campaign is finished than the uh, Imperial War Museum in London. Um, so, what have we? What have we done so far? Uh, we built the uh, Solomon Victory Theater, 400-seat theater, where we show uh, the Beyond All Boundaries, our 4D movie. Uh, included in that building, we also have the stage at our canteen, uh, increasingly popular, showing things like uh, the, uh, the Victory Bells, a trio that uh, mimics the Andrews Sisters. We have the Frank Sinatra Show, the Big Band Show, and a number of other shows. We also have uh, our American Sector Restaurant. The next large building, uh, courtesy partly of the Boeing Company, was the U.S. Freedom Pavilion where we have a B-17 hanging and a B-25, a dive bomber, a torpedo bomber, a Corsair, a B-51, <laughs> uh, and, and catwalks around them so that you can 
go up and see them up close. Next, uh, our next uh, uh, next next operation was our, well was our train ride. Uh, we have the train ride since we all went to went to war on the train. We have a simulated train ride, which is the <clears throat> the introduction to our um, dog tag experience, uh, where you where you get a, you select a, a a soldier, a sailor, a marine, and you go around the museum and in various places you can put the dog tag down and listen to your soldiers' uh, experiences. Uh, next was the, is the Campaigns of Courage Building, the road to Berlin on the first floor and the road to Tokyo on the second floor. Uh, we just opened the uh, road to Tokyo in, the, in December of 2015. Uh, when you walk in, you're on the bridge of the uh, a uh, aircraft carrier uh, Enterprise, and it goes on from there. Uh, this week, I think we're opening our 450-slot parking garage, and the open parking lot next door will be our hotel and conference center. So, uh, briefly, uh, you all come. Uh, we'd be happy to see you. We have 135,000 members now. So 35,000 new members uh, last year. In March of this year, uh, the paid attendance was 70,000. So you see, we're we're moving along. It's not it's not a little two-bit operation on the bayou. Thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to talk about. Uh, Topic tonight, mystery quest behind the scenes of the History Channel's Hitler's Escape. In 2009, the History Channel approached UConn's Dr. Nicholas Bellatoni to be the lead researcher in a documentary investigating the death of Adolf Hitler. Dr. Bellatoni agreed, joining the production team in Germany and Russia to examine and gather evidence. While in Europe, he studied human bone fragments, reviewed one secret documents, and gathered soil and other samples for forensic analysis. Returning to Yukon, he worked with Dr. Linda Strasbaugh and her team from Yukon Center for Applied Genetics and Technology to analyze the biological samples uh, of ev for evidence uh, of DNA. What they discovered deepened the mystery of Hitler's final moments and brought international attention to this multidisciplinary approach of forensic anthropology and forensic genetics at Yukon. Dr. Bellatoni serves as a emeritus state archaeologist with the Connecticut State Museum of Natural History and Archaeology uh, Center and the Department of Anthropology in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Connecticut. He received his doctorate in anthropology from UConn in 1987 and was uh, shortly thereafter appointed state archaeologist. He serves as an adjunct associate research professor in the Department of Anthropology at UConn and is a former state commissioner uh, for the Commission on Culture and Tourism and sat on the State Historic Preservation Council for 15 years. He's president of the Archaeological Society of Connecticut and a former president of the National Association of State Archaeologists. His research background includes the analysis of skeletal remains from Eastern North America, and he's been excavating in Connecticut for over 40 years. I now present Dr. Bellatoni. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, this is a real, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. And it's a, uh, you know, a real honor for me to be here because uh, I've given this talk, the presentation in Connecticut and talked to people about my experience uh, with the, the, uh, the research we did into the death of Adolf Hitler. And, uh, you know, I almost have to like start from the beginning. But you guys, this is a very um, educated crowd when it comes to the World War II. And what I hope will happen here is that there will be, a, a, you know, maybe after I'm done, there will be some give and take. Because, you know, you guys, you know, I can tell you right now, I'm an archaeologist, so you guys do know more about World War II than I do. And uh, we'll want, you know, I'd love to hear from you uh, when this is over and get much of your opinions and, and so forth about what you think happened. Let me just preface this by saying I am not a conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. Hitler died in the bunker. I think when you look at all of the evidences, uh, that there's no question about that. It became a mystery and unsolved simply because of what Stalin did in terms of 
withholding information. And it also is because right now we don't have any, you know, specific forensic data. That doesn't mean he didn't die there. It's a matter of, I think, as I'll explain as we go further on, that, uh, you know, that data does exist. It's out there. And if, if, if forensic scientists can get a hold of the samples that are necessary, then we could really literally solve, from a scientific point of view, what happened in April and May of 1945 in Berlin. It's possible. And someday, I think, it will be resolved. Uh, until then, it, it remains uh, somewhat of a mystery. And so History Channel has promoted this history. I have to tell you a couple of things about how I got involved in all of this and um, how it all came about. Um, um, in fact, when it was over and they titled it Hitler's Escape, I said, he didn't escape. <laughs> and uh, they still went ahead with the title. But, uh, we got so I have to tell you how it happened. Uh, basically, well, uh, I had done a number, uh, no, I shouldn't say a number, but two, two or three um, uh, shows with the History Channel and, and some of their producers. And I guess they came out pretty good. And so they would contact me every now and then, send me an email and say, gee, Nick, we're thinking of doing this, this, and that. you have any suggestions for us? So I was kind of an unpaid uh, consultant, you know. So they, they contacted me, I think it was like the beginning of uh, probably March of 2009. And they said, we're thinking of doing a, a program uh, on some research uh, on the death of Adolf Hitler. We're going to do some excavating. We'd like to do some excavating in Germany. and." We're making arrangements to go to Moscow to take a look at a cranial vault fragment that the Russians believe were it was in fact Hitler. So I gave them a couple of things to do. You know what you know what they could look for on the ground, what what kind of things they might want to do forensically when they're in Moscow and so forth. And they got back to me and they said, "Gee, this is all great. Would you be our scientist? Would you come with us?" And I said, "Well, you know, no. I said I'm, I'm not qualified." I said, I'm not a historian in World War II. I said, I've never excavated in Germany. I mean, my work has basically been the archaeology of Connecticut, you know, colonial and Indian history. Um, so I told them, no, I'm not qualified. You need somebody, you know, that has more of a background in this. So uh, I went home that night, and, uh, you know, my wife and I are having dinner, and uh, I happened to mention to her, I said, the History Channel wants to send me to Germany and Russia on a program on the death of Adolf Hitler. And she said, when are you leaving? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, I told them no. I said, I'm not, this is not my, uh, she said, well, you know, being a good Italian wife, you bop me off the head. She said, what are you, crazy? You got to do this. And, you know, how could you not uh, do that? So I said, you know, so I thought about it that night. I got back to the History Channel the following morning. And uh, um, I said, yeah, if you, if you still want me, I, I reconsider. And they evidently wanted me. And within like five days, I was on a plane flying to, to Berlin and then uh, off into Moscow. Um, as I said, Hitler died in the bunker. But they still called it Hitler's Escape. And they have a new program out now called Hunting Hitler. And some of you may have seen that. I did a cameo on one of the episodes. Um, I don't want to see it, so I haven't even looked at it yet. But um, um, in fact, it's been so successful, they've just signed on for two more years. So they did four episodes. They're now scheduled to do eight episodes. I don't know how they're going to keep this going for eight episodes, but they're going to do it. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, even though I'm involved with these, um, I don't believe that Hitler's still out there. Um, um, that, in fact, he, he didn't die down in the bunker. The best way to do this, and, and again, I'm kind of, again, like I said, preaching to the choir, you guys know this history, you guys and gals know this history, uh, so, um, but uh, let's go through it. I want to, uh, and the best way to do it, there's so much going on at this time, just create a timeline and follow that timeline uh, leading up to literally my research and what we ended up doing and then, then talking about that. But you guys know that in 1945, on January 16th, Hitler occupies the bunker. He comes in. Uh, and the bunker was a, a two-stage bunker, two-level bunker. The, the originally, uh, one is underneath the Reich Chancellery, and the one that Hitler occupied was under the Reich Chancellery garden. So basically what it looked like in this schematic this was the part that was under the Reich Chancellery itself. It was only about five feet or less uh, uh, underneath the building. But, uh, and this was completed, I think, in 1936, if I'm not mistaken. And this wasn't completed. It's a lower level, down about 30 feet. This was uh, built in 19, finished in 1944. So it was built during the war at a greater level down 
uh, for the, and of course Hitler's, Hitler's uh, and Eva Braun's quarters would be here. It's got a, a, a conning tower to bring air down in it and a stairwell that led out into the Rice Chancellery Garden. Uh, one of the photographs you probably have seen is showing what the, the Hitler's quarters would look like. And you may know also they tried to dress this up as much as they could. They brought in rugs and, and some in cases some fine furniture and, and, and paintings and so forth, trying to make it as homely as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's hunkered down in a bunker uh, underneath the streets. Uh, and certainly as the Battle of Berlin takes place, Berlin's getting just wiped out uh, by, the, by the Allied bombing. Um, also on that day, that day is significant because that is the day that the Red Army breaches the German front. And once they do that, it's, they're very quickly coming into Berlin. Uh, it's a fast route once they break through the, uh, that, uh, that section. And you know how it all worked out. Again, I'm, you know, I feel bad I'm even telling you this because you already know it. But you understand that uh, Eisenhower gave um, uh, Stalin uh, the right to go into Berlin. Eisenhower felt that Hitler was probably going to be in Bavaria up in the Eagle's Nest at his fortress. Uh, and we came in from more from the south. The Russians came in. They actually had two armies coming in, but the Northern Army went right for uh, Berlin. Churchill was very upset about this. He, he argued with Eisenhower. Eisenhower stressed that Berlin was not a military target. There's no reason. But Churchill understood that it was of political importance and did not want the Soviets to get there first. Um, and he argued with uh, Eisenhower over this, but Eisenhower. Um, feels that Stalin and the Russians uh, really deserve their, this because of all they've gone through on the Eastern Front. This is the last official photograph of Adolf Hitler uh, taking uh, in March 22nd. While he's in the bunker, he comes out. And, and, and there's also a video, there's some film footage of this, and some of you may have seen that film footage. Um, he's giving some brown shirts, some very young boys, uh, medals, uh, you know, for the, for the war effort here. Um, um, and if you see those, those films, like I'm sure you have, you can see this is a very sick man. Uh, he's got shakes. He keeps his hands in that film. If you watch it, his pants are in his pocket because he doesn't want to be filmed with the shakes that he had. Um, and you can see in his face he's going through, he's going through a, a mental and physical deterioration. Um, there was one German officer who, when interviewed, had suggested that Hitler may have even had a stroke while he was in the bunker. And of course, there were uh, other cases of possible nervous breakdowns at the same time. So he's failing, and one of the reasons why I don't believe he escaped, he was really failing badly. Well, on April 12th, as you know, Franklin Roosevelt dies. And Hitler sees this as divine revelation. This is, this is God saying now that the Nazi cause is gonna win. We're gonna eliminate, the, God eliminated the, the leader of the Western world of the American world, this was God's way of telling him that they were going to persevere. And obviously, he's pretty um, delusional at the time. Um, it really, obviously, uh, had no effect on the war On April 15th, Eva Braun arrives at the bunker. And he doesn't want her there. He tells her to leave, and, and probably recognizing that the end is coming. But he, he wants her out of there. But she refuses to leave. She, she stays loyal to him, and she tells him that I will stay here with you until the end. Uh, and I think he, he saw that as, uh, you know, uh, um, a loyalty that he felt at this time everybody else was doing away with. He was being betrayed by his generals. He was being betrayed by, the reason they were losing the war is because they were betraying him. And uh, here's this woman that comes to him and refuses to leave, and he would marry her uh, before they both commit suicide. And on April 20th, uh, Hitler turns 56 years of age while he's in the bunker. And they actually, how macabre it must have been, how eerie. They celebrate his birthday. You know, they have a little party, they wish the Fuhrer happy returns in many years. And they all know that the end is, is moments, days away. Uh, but they put on the facade that, um, you know, uh, wishing him uh, a happy birthday, but how, how macabre, how bizarre that whole scene must have been. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, by late March, the Red Army is right at Berlin, and the Battle of Berlin would begin on, on the 20th, April 20th, and extend to May 2nd, when the Russians would eventually come into uh, and take over Berlin. Um, 
And of course, you could see here that the bombing at this point was devastating to, to Berlin. On April 22nd, his propaganda minister, <laughs> Joseph Goebbels, broadcast that Hitler is in Berlin and he's staying there to fight with his troops. In other words, what he basically tells them, Hitler's got a gun in his hand, he's on the front, and he's defending the, the capital, right, along with the other soldiers. It doesn't say that he's hunkered in a bunker. But, uh, you know, uh, for public announcement, the propaganda would be that he was actually on the front fighting. Um, and also on that day, he not only gives that broadcast, but he brings his family, uh, his wife Magna, and six of their young children into the bunker, and they will to stay there un until the end. And also, it's, an, it's another significant day, and because this is when Steiner's offensive, if you will, fails. Um, Hitler comes up with a plan to, uh, that Felix, General Felix Steiner is going to uh, hopefully implement for him, he says, uh, kind of a pincher operation to, to get the Russians uh, as they come in. And Steiner realizes he hasn't got the manpower, he hasn't got the way, he has, at this point, they have nothing, and he cannot do this. And Hitler just goes into a rage that afternoon. Um, and some people there say he, that he, uh, at that point, suffered a nervous breakdown. He screamed, all is lost, all is lost. And he now feels he's being betrayed, not only by Steiner, but he's being betrayed by everyone, all of his generals, and it's, it's all their fault. Uh, and he's, he's literally uh, um, losing it uh, at this point. And of course, the Russians come in, uh, and they're led by Zhukov, George Luke Zhukov. You know, it always amazes me. Zhukov it was, you know, and you guys have studied World War II. I don't have to explain Zhukov to you uh, as I have to I, normally to other people because very few have even heard of him. And the fact is, he was a really brilliant military strategist. He really was brilliant. The reason we don't know about him, as we know about uh, more about other uh, uh, World War II generals, is Stalin, of course, took all the credit. It was Stalin that was the mastermind, and uh, he, he downplayed Zhukov uh, pretty well. And, but Zhukov was, was a, 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 a wonderful strategist. So on the 27th, um, it, it, the Russians are there, and uh, Hitler confines to the people in the bunker, his uh, uh, military and, and uh, administrative staff, uh, that he and Eva Braun will commit suicide. And he calls it a ritual self-sacrifice. The way he describes it to them is that he's going to be ready when the Russians come in. And as soon as they come in, then he would commit suicide. But that's not, of course, how he really wanted it and how it would end up. Um, basically, he did not want his body to be found. He did not want to happen to him like uh, the, the Italians did to Mussolini. And after he was dead, they berated him. They hung him up uh, at a plaza, the local gas station, uh, and, and literally mutilated and berated him. Hitler says, I do not want the Jews or the Russians to find my body, because he knows what they will do to him. And so um, his order is that his remains, after they do this suicide, that his remains would be cremated beyond recognition. He wanted cremation to ashes, so that when they found those ashes, there's no way they would know it's Adolf Hitler. And that was the, the game plan, so to speak. Um, on the 29th, he marries Ava and, um, uh, in, in, a, in a short ceremony. Later that night, he dictates his last will and political testament. And it's really, again, another uh, strange document, uh, obviously, uh, but um, one of the things he writes in that will and testament is that all the artwork that has been accumulated, that he has, will be given to a museum in his hometown in honor of him, and they will exhibit all of this art, art that obviously he stole from a number of families, of Jewish families and others. This was all stolen art, but he in his will says it's going to go to a museum in his honor. And so, obviously, he's uh, not quite uh, with reality in terms of what is happening and what is about to happen. Um, on the 30th, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they bid their farewell. And what they do is kind of Ava and, 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 and Adolf, uh, kind of, you know, like a wedding reception, you know, where you come and greet the bride. Uh, the, the, the whole entourage in the bunker would come by and they would shake hands. And, and he, he was encouraging. Uh, 
others to commit suicide too. He was telling others of the staff, and, and, and you should commit suicide. And basically the idea was, you know, if, 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 Nazis don't, if Nazism cannot survive, then Germany should not survive. We should all die. And so it's best that you just kill yourself, and like we're going to do. And so he was, to his mind, if his right could not survive, then nothing else should survive. And, uh, and this is what he does when he bids them farewell. Uh, shortly thereafter, they say their goodbyes, and they go into his quarters together. And about the way the story is told, um, a gun, they're waiting outside, the soldiers are waiting outside, a gunshot is heard, they wait a moment, then they go in, and they find Adolf Hitler, um, Many, there's many, many accounts as to what happened when they saw them. But the account is, he's got a gun in his hand, bullet wound. She is laying on the sofa next to him. And one of the accounts is that she is so peaceful looking. It looks like she's asleep. Uh, uh, where she had taken cyanide and he had put a gun to his head. Uh, Hitler uh, asked his doctor what was the best way to commit suicide. You know, what was the quickest, most efficient way? And the doctor said, well, put a gun to your head or bite on a cyanide capsule. But Hitler didn't trust the cyanide capsule. In fact, um, the doctor had to show him that it really worked. He had a, a, a dog uh, in the bunker with him, Blondie, and uh, um, they put the cyanide tablet in the mouth, jam it, and the dog dies in an instant to show Hitler that it works. But um, he, whether he was, not sure of it. Eva is peaceful. She dies that way. Um, there's one account, I was telling them earlier, that we read of a German soldier who said that when they came in there, they saw, she looked so peaceful like she was asleep. They, didn't, they weren't sure if she was really dead. Uh, and supposedly one officer, they shot her in the chest, in the heart, to, uh, to make sure she was dead. There's only one account of that. None of the other accounts mention that, uh, that Eva was shot in any way. So there's a number of accounts, and again, the uncertainty of actually what went on there. Well, after they're dead, they wrap them in blankets. The soldiers bring them, the German soldiers bring them up into the Reich Chancellery Garden with that stairwell you saw. And there's a, there's a crater from, from one of the bombs, uh, about three, four foot down. So they throw the bodies in there, and they douse them with gasoline, and they set them on fire, hoping to perform this cremation to ashes that Adolf was looking for. The problem is, this was an outdoor fire. This was not a crematory. This is not an indoor uh, situation. And uh, the human body has a lot of fluid in it. You know, you've got water and blood and so forth. And so what ends up happening is the fire kept going out. And they douse them again, and they burn them again. And the fire kept going out. And they did this a number of times, trying to create this cremation. And it literally never came off. Um, and so they got to the point where um, um, it was getting near midnight, it was a hectic process, the Russians are at the door, they just bury them in that crater and leave them, hoping that nobody will, uh, will ever find them. Um, so, oh, there's Blondie, by the way, there's the, there's the dog. So all three of them would die in that bunker. Um, um, the dog pre predeceases uh, them, obviously, when the doctor was there, but uh, they would all die in that bunker. So uh, the next day, May 1st, Germany surrenders. And of course, you know that those, those uh, um, German surrender conditions are refused by the Russians. They were unconditional surrender. And the man that brought that surrender out is a guy by the name of uh, Hans Krebs. Krebs uh, brought the, he's an important guy in the story because not only did he occupy the bunker, um, and bring the, um, um, the, the surrender conditions to the Russians, but um, he would also sign Hitler's last will, and he would commit suicide when the Russians enter the bunker. And when they break into his office, boom, he shoots himself. And he would eventually be buried with Hitler, Braun, and, the, and, the, and all the Goebbels family um, together, uh, commingled in, in five ammunition crates. So, uh, later that day, the six Goebbels children that are occupying the bunker are given dope chocolate and, and then 
they are all poisoned. Uh, um, uh, Magda and Joseph kill uh, all of their children. And of course, this is a, this is a photograph. The son in the background, the older son, is uh, was, was serving in the German army. He was from a, a former marriage of uh, Joseph Goebbels. But these are the young children that were in the bunker uh, that were all were all killed by their parents. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible story. Um, but obviously, they did not want their children to live in a world that would not have Hitler's Nazism, and. Um, and they, of course, would also commit suicide with the idea that they would be um, cremated, much like Adolf Hitler, and nobody would recognize Joseph's body. Uh, and again, he did not want to be, uh, want to be taken. So um, about 8.30 that night, they both go up. There's a German soldier that follows them. They, uh, they ask for some privacy. Gunshots are heard, and then... Um, um, they find them dead. They burn them. Same process with Hitler. They kept going out. They could not keep the, the cremation going. And eventually, they just buried them very quickly. So what ended up happening is their bodies would end up being like somebody, God forbid, a house fire or a car fire. But they weren't cremated beyond recognition. Okay. So uh, May 1st, also, uh, Germany announces that Hitler is dead <clears throat> that night. And they don't say he committed suicide in the bunker. They basically say he dies on the front with a rifle in his hand defending the capital. And um, they mention nothing about him committing suicide in the bunker. And of course, by that evening, uh, the communist flag flies over the Reichstag. Uh, the, the, the Soviets are now in Berlin and in control. Well, one of the first things that happen when they get into Berlin is they know Hitler's here. They've heard rumors that he committed suicide. Um, they seal off uh, the Reich Chancellery, but they want to find his body. That is like the, one of the main things. And instead of the army under Zhukov searching for that body, what basically ended up happening is Schmirsch, uh, which was a, you know, uh, an acronym for the Soviet military counter-agency, kind of their CIA, they take over the investigation. They pull Zhukov aside. They're the ones that are going to find uh, uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, and so they, they begin the search to it, uh, for it. On May 2nd, 12 Russian uh, women from the Red Army uh, uh, Medical Corps stumble on the bunker in the morning, notify the, uh, the other authorities, uh, and the first Russian combat troopers enter, um, very shortly after that, enter the bunker. That's when Krebs will put a gun to his head and shoot himself. Um, and at that point, the last Germans in the bunker all surrender. And it's also that day that they found Goebbels' body. They found him right away. They did not find Hitler right away. Um, there was a, you know, an individual they thought was Hitler, was well photographed, and you <coughs> probably have all seen that photograph. Um, but um, they realized fairly quickly that it wasn't him. On May 3rd, the children are found um, and uh, are brought up. Um, they, they were still in the bunker. On the fourth, uh, they, the, the corpses of Hitler, Braun, Bondi are, are, are found. The way I understand the story is a Russian soldier who was uh, stationed in the Reich Chancellery Garden saw something sticking out of the ground and it looked like a pant leg or something. He wasn't quite sure. And he went and did a little digging and he found a dog. And he said, well, this can't be what, you know, this can't be what we're looking for. And he covers it back up. But he does mention it. Uh, and then on the 5th, they would come back, and now they would dig into it and exhume the bodies. And the idea at this point would be now to do an autopsy to find out if this, in fact, was Adolf Hitler. It was burned. Um, it, it, it wasn't that, you know, you, you could just look at the face and see it um, and, and make an identification. So May 8th, of course, we all celebrate Victory in Europe Day, but it's also on May 8th that the autopsy begins on Hitler, Eva Braun, uh, especially, uh, to make a, the positive, a much positive identification as they claim. So the external, I got to, when I was in Russia, I got to look at that um, um, uh, autopsy. And, uh, you know, if you, if you see the History Channel program, you'll see me flipping the pages. And, uh, uh, um, and one of my buddies, when I came home, said, I didn't know you could read Russian. <laughs> and I said, no, you know, I can't. Uh, but of course, we had interpreters there that working with us and uh, uh, helping us uh, 
uh, get as much information as we possibly can. So the external examination of Hitler's body revealed a male uh, disfigured by fire. Interestingly enough, they say in the other, we cannot determine age. They're not sure how old this individual is, which I find very, very unusual. Uh, but they do say, and this is very important, that part of the cranium is missing. Now the cranium is your skull, okay? But the problem with the autopsy is it doesn't say what part, which parts of the cranium are missing, okay? Um, so it doesn't say which skeletal elements are not there and so forth. So it's rather, rather incomplete, but it's an intriguing thing, especially since I will be called back to look at a cranial vault fragment. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but who is doing the autopsy? Oh, I'm sorry, the Russian pathologist. In Moscow? Or they were doing it in Berlin. Okay. They were doing it in Berlin. They did not remove the bodies out of Berlin. They, you know, they took the bodies, must have brought them to a, a medical facility, uh, and did an autopsy there. Okay? But no, these were Russian pathologists. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so it says that birds are more pronounced on the right side. They found splinters of glass in his mouth, in his cheek. And of course, that was an indication that possibly he bit on a cyanide capsule. Now, some people, there's some, again, there's so many different stories as to what happened. One story is that he put a cyanide capsule in his mouth, and just in case that didn't work, he shot himself at the same time. Now, whether all that is true or not, and exactly what happened, nobody knows. But they did mention that there was glass in his mouth. They say there's no sign of severe injuries or illnesses. He has a dental bridge in his upper jaw, okay? He had very poor dental health. Uh, in fact, he only had, I believe, he had all of his teeth on top were missing, um, and he only had maybe four or five teeth in his lower jaw that were still in his mouth. Uh, but the lower jaw was present and had dentition in it. So this is a, a film of, uh, of, the, of that bridge. They were able to make contact with Hitler's dentist, and they were able to get both the, the dental x-rays of Eva Braun and, uh, and Adolf Hitler. And this is one of them you could find online. But uh, the thing is, um, when you look at it, uh, back in 1945, the best way you're going to identify a body like this is through dental records. That's before DNA, that's the way we did it. So um, they were looking at those dental records. They masked what they saw in the autopsy up with the x-ray. Um, and. Um, and it, it, it matched up very well. The internal autopsy of Adolf Hitler says basically his internal organs are normal, uh, but they did not dissect those organs. And they mentioned distinctly that there's no scent of a bitter almond smell. And that, of course, anyone that has taken cyanide, which is an almond abstract, basically you smell that all they smelled it with Ava Braun in her autopsy they they, they distinctly refer to it how soon but after it, the uh, the death did they do the autopsy say again how soon after they died did they do the autopsy they did uh, they died within um, well they died on what the 30th the autopsy started on the 8th of May so they still had to about smell. 7 days oh yes 7 8 days yes no uh, they, they, especially when they cut open when they cut open and the, you could just basically uh, uh, the thing that's uh, interesting here is uh, they conclude for Hitler that based on the autodontal evidence, the teeth that the cause of uh, that it was Adolf Hitler they positively felt that they identified him they list cyanide poisoning as the what he died of they mentioned nothing about a gunshot and it's hard to believe that the pathologist would have missed that. And it was only a partial autopsy at best. They did no chemical test. Uh, um, you know, this is nothing like what we would do today in an autopsy. But you've got to remember, I think, too, their only charge, for those Russian pathologists, their only charge was, is this Adolf Hitler? That was it. Could you identify Adolf Hitler? They weren't going to go into aspects of cause of death or... Uh, uh, you know, other problems. They were just interested. And once they felt they had identified him, as far as they were concerned, the autopsy was over. So it's a very incomplete autopsy. And, and, and um, somewhat understandably under the conditions. But uh, one would think that they would have done, uh, hopefully it would have done more. 
So what ends up happening is they send a mandible, the jaw of Hitler, to Moscow with the autopsy report and with the dental x-rays from his dentist. And they send it there to convince Stalin that we've got him. This is Hitler. And so they put all of this information together. Well, Stalin absolutely goes, rejects this. As far as Stalin's concerned, this is, uh, 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 he rejects the autopsy report. All of this stuff comes to him. As far as he's concerned, Hitler is either still in Berlin or he has escaped. We do not have Hitler. Um, he is so mad, you talk about the Russian pathologist, he is so mad, he sends one of those pathologists to the Gulag. He, he, he literally sends them to Siberia. He's so mad. He, he refuses to accept that they had found Hitler. Uh, and of course, that's what leads to all of the controversy we have today. Because while everyone, you know, the, the, the Germans have said it, and everyone, you know, is celebrating that Hitler is dead, um, um, is the, the official word from the Soviet Union was, we have not found Hitler. We do not know where Hitler is. And in fact, he accuses the West of hiding him out. He accuses the Americans of hiding Hitler. Uh, 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 and yet his doctors are telling him that we have him. But, uh, you know, uh, and many have asked, well, why would Stalin deny it? And, you know, you know Stalin had enough of, uh, had his share of paranoia, I suppose. But, you know, there's another way to look at it. Uh, and that is that everyone knew that once Hitler was dead, the Cold War would begin. We knew that communism and democracy weren't going to be able to maintain themselves as allies. We were allies when we had a common enemy. Once that enemy is eliminated, the Cold War began. Some have suggested that maybe Stalin was trying to prolong the Cold War at this point by claiming that Hitler was still alive. Uh, but, um, um, oh gosh, what it starts is, you know, Hitler's in Sweden, Hitler's in Argentina, he's in more places than Elvis Presley. They got this guy everywhere on. And, uh, and in fact, I remember when the, when the show came out and uh, I, got a, I received an email from a woman in upstate New York who was uh, working at a, a, a rest home, a facility, uh, and, uh, uh, and she says, I knew he escaped. He's in my rest home right now. I know this guy's got to be Hitler. And I said, do you realize he'd be 135 years old? I don't think it's Hitler. But, uh, you know, Hitler is now everywhere. And of course, because of the way Stalin and the Soviet Union handled this, you know, it keeps the mystery to this day. We don't have the forensic evidence that we would have wanted or could have had to demonstrate what happened there or refute it. Let the science speak for itself. But um, uh, everything uh, uh, was basically destroyed. Um, and basically how it was destroyed is after the autopsies, all of them, Hitler, Braun, Krebs, the Goebbels family, and the Goebbels family had a dog, so two dogs uh, uh, are all buried in five ammunition crates. The bodies are commingled. They just pile them in, they close them up, and they <coughs> bury them. And they bury them outside of Berlin. And they must have been, you know, they must have been kind of, uh, you know, uh, paranoid that somebody would find them because they dig them up and they bury them again. And they dig them up and, and they keep burying them at different places. You know, I'm assuming that they were just afraid somebody was going to find them. And of course, it's not till seven weeks later in July that the United States and, and, and the British forces actually enter Berlin. And by that time, uh, the Soviet Union has had uh, Berlin to itself for seven weeks and all evidences are, are uh, at that point gone. They're buried in terms of the bodies, um, but um, nobody had access to them. Not the American pathologist, not anyone else. Uh, to do an independent review. So what ends up happening is our timeline goes on to the end of 1945, okay? Stalin is kind of, you know, he, Hitler has not been found yet. And so Stalin has this issue now. He needs a commission. He needs a report that <coughs> says whether they found St uh, Hitler or not. Uh, and they create this uh, commission, MIF commission, to gather all and review all the records, look at the forensic evidence, and. Uh, that occurred uh, back in May and June, uh, interrogate, they interrogate uh, some of the German uh, soldiers that were in the bunker, um, 
And eventually their role is to reconcile or explain inconsistencies with the autopsy and the evidence. And basically, the unstated purpose here was to produce a document that Stalin would be satisfied with, that in fact is either inconclusive or that they did not find uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, and uh, they begin by tearing up the autopsy report. For the most part, they just throw it out and they just don't even want to deal with it and they start really uh, all over again. Uh, so, a year later, 1946, May, that's over a year now since the, since the Russians came in in 45, May of 45, and on the second, uh, they come in. They, this commission goes uh, back to Berlin uh, and they go to the Reich Chancery Garden and they are doing their investigation and I guess they must have done some poking around and digging and they find two fragments of a skull cap. It's actually the, the back of, of the skull uh, uh, pertaining to what's called the occipital bone back here and the two parietal bones here. And there's a, a, an exit bullet wound coming out of it and it does show signs of burning. Okay. Um, they find this, and a couple of them, um, you know, suggest, well, maybe this is Hitler. Maybe this is Hitler. Remember, the first report said this part of the cranium was missing, um, and um, they would send these uh, this skull cap to the Russian archives. Now, that mandible that went first, that mandible stayed with the Soviet police. Okay, that did not go to the Federation. The only thing a year later, when they found this. Um, so they speculate that maybe this is Hitler. But they could have found out. Because they knew where the bodies were buried. They could have gone to those bodies, exhumed them, and done another autopsy to see if this fits. They didn't do it. Maybe because they didn't want to determine whether it was You know, it, it, a lot of things were going on, obviously. But they could have solved it right there. They could have solved it right there if they just went back to the bodies and did another autopsy. Uh, but they did, decided not to do that, but they do bring the skull cap back. Uh, okay. So in terms of this, the, the archives, uh, that, some of which we got to look at, they interrogated 800 witnesses, 70 members of his entourage were actually now taken to Russia and sent to Siberia. Um, and what they conclude is the first examination by the Russian pathologist was not properly conducted. The commission does not think it's possible to arrive at a final conclusion. We do not state this was Hitler. And of course it adds to the intrigue as the possibility that Hitler may have gotten away. Okay? But they had the data that they could have looked at. On, the, on uh, February of 1946, not quite a year later, okay, they dig them up again. And this time, for the last time, around uh, um, uh, Berlin. They take the five ammunition crates with all of those bodies in it, and they bring it to a city called Marlborg on the Elbe River, about 80 miles east of Berlin. Uh, and this is a very, uh, you know, a very, you know, medieval town uh, in Marlborg. And what they do is they bury the five ammunition crates with all these bodies in the courtyard of a Soviet officer's compound. This was a garden, and so they decided, because the Soviets controlled that compound, that nobody would find them, and they buried them there, under the, under the flower beds, if you will, okay? And they remained there until 1970. By the way, it, was 19, it wasn't until 1968 that the Soviet government acknowledged publicly that they had found Hitler originally. But by now, the conspiracy theories are out there, and many people are not buying into it. They lay in that garden in Mogelberg at the compound until 1970. What happens, oh, and this is what it looks like today when I went there in, uh, uh, in uh, 2009. It's obviously overgrown. It's now a private residence. Uh, the, the property owner was very gracious in allowing us uh, uh, to come uh, uh, they wanted us to do a couple of test excavations, but I really didn't see that this was going to really give us anything, uh, basically because on April 4th of 1970, Brezhnev orders the disinterment of all of them 
and the final destruction. He wants it destroyed. He doesn't want it. And not only anybody would find it, he wants it destroyed now to ashes, like it was supposed to be the first time. And so what they do is they, uh, they dig them up, and there's the account, which is really kind of interesting. Five wooden boxes positioned crosswise have rotten away, turned into a jelly mass, and that's really what's going to happen organically. Uh, and the remains are all mixed with earth. The bone fragments of Hitler, Braun, and R are all mixed up with those of the Krebs and the Goebbels family so that no one could tell uh, which was which. And I read that and I'm going, but a forensic anthropologist could tell which is which. You know, we could have, we could have, uh, we've worked with commingled remains before, uh, and, and they, they, you know, they can be sorted out relatively easily, uh, you know, with the basic characteristics of the skeleton. So the reason we could do that is because, you know, the skeleton that's inside you is not just this hard thing to keep you upright and protect your vital organs. It does that. But it's living tissue, and it modifies to your life from growth and development. It, its signature is your diet, the amount of exercise you give it, the diseases you've had in some cases. Um, when we analyze a skeleton, when we do a skeleton, we literally get the whole life history of an individual. We could tell age, sex, we could tell sometimes uh, if a person's right-handed or left-handed, we could tell an adult woman if she's given birth sometimes and, and even estimate how many kids she's had. Um, you've seen CSI and, and bones, you know this stuff, right? So you could have sorted this out. We, you know, if, if the proper forensic people were involved with this, but they weren't. What they did is they took those five ammunition crates, they brought it to a Soviet military facility outside of Mongolburg, where there was a morgue, and they burned them to ashes. And this is what's left of that morgue. That Soviet uh, military base was... Um, 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 uh, this, this band did it quite a long time ago. In fact, what I forgot to mention was that the reason 1970 is important is in 1970, the Soviet Union decided to give that officer's compound to the East German government. <coughs> they were going to relinquish control of it, and that's when Brezhnev did not want the bodies to be found. So he had them dug up before the East Germans got that. Uh, got that. So this is what it, it looks like today. We were able to locate it. I did a couple of test excavations around to see if I could see anything in the soil that might uh, indicate what had happened there. Uh, but basically what had happened was this. The bones, the destruction was carried out by burning in a fire on the waste ground. The remains were burned away, were ground with embers and ashes, literally to the ashes that Hitler was originally looking for, and now thrown into one of the tributaries of the Elbe River. It's actually the biter bits. So basically, they really, now after 20-something years, it's just a dry bone. And so the cremation must have been very simple at that point, just burning the bones and then mashing them up and then carting them off to the, the, the bitter bits. Ritz. Uh, and this is the, what the bridge looks like today. Um, it was more of a, uh, this is a remodeled bridge. I believe it was wooden at the time. They came to this bridge and they literally dumped the ashes and everything into the brook, which would eventually uh, flow down into the Elbe River. And that literally is the end of the forensic evidence, except for the skull cap and the mandible that were still in Moscow. So now we jump to April of 2009, and the History Channel sends me a message, and I say no, and my wife says yes, and so we ended up taking part in this. Um, and so we went to um, uh, Germany, um, went to a few sites like the morgue, did some excavating, uh, and then had uh, uh, the opportunity to go to Moscow uh, to the state archives of the Russian Federation. This is like uh, the Library of Congress uh, for, for the Russian uh, government. And they, they, keep, they archive a lot of historic data there. And this is where that, that skull cap... Uh, I can't tell you the whole story, uh, but we, were, we, were, we had a contract with the, the Federation uh, and they were supposed to allow us four hours to do the work. That is to say, to get samples, to, to do a forensic study, to go over documents and so forth. And when we arrived, they told us we had less than an hour. We had less than an hour and we had to be out. And uh, of course, it was a very difficult uh, procedure to do. And you can see my hairy little arms uh, as I'm holding that, that um, uh, cradle vault fragment that was found 
in May of 1946, and I emphasize that, a year later, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute, get samples to, to do a forensic study, to go over documents and so forth, and when we arrived, they told us we had less than an hour. We had less than an hour and we had to be out. And uh, of course, it was a very difficult uh, procedure to do. And you can see my hairy little arms uh, as I'm holding that, that um, uh, cradle vault fragment that was found in May of 1946. And I emphasize that a year later. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. So I get to do, a, you know, very quickly, uh, you know, just a, a forensic exam of, of, of the thing, uh, of the skull cap. And, you know, right away, you know, when you prepare to do research like this, you know, you've got, you know, all the biological data you can get, everything you need to know about it. Uh, and so you have some expectations of, if this is Adolf Hitler, what we should see, okay? Um, and I didn't see those, uh, those expectations. The first thing, of course, you could see the, the exit bullet wound. This is a, a wound that's coming out the back of the left parietal uh, toward the, the, uh, the posterior end. Uh, this is from somebody that was either shot like this or like this, okay? Blowing out the back of the head, okay? And, and that's the exit wound. Uh, so that was pretty clear. And the burning, you can see the scorching. The scorching, again, this is not a, a, you know, a cremation by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a burning, and you can see the evidence of the burning. One of the things that, that um, uh, when I saw, I was kind of confused about, and that is uh, the sutures, okay? Now, the sutures are, are um, you know, those zigzag kind of jigsaw puzzle of uh, your skull plates that come over and protect your brain, okay? Uh, when you are born, um, those are just plates. They're not fused. So this way, the, 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 if its skull is actually pliable, it's, it's spongy, so it can get through a very tight birth canal, okay? But as you grow and develop, those bones come over, and they kind of articulate together in that jigsaw puzzle, okay? Uh, and then what ends up happening is you get older, you know, those very clear, you know, lines start to obliterate. They close down. So, um, mine and most of yours are closed. <laughs> it varies, you know, there's a lot of biological variability, but you know, as you get into your 50s and 60s and more, you know, it starts to obliterate. Those lines literally become solid bone and they're gone. Well, here, they're wide open. And they're not wide open because of the bullet wound, which would have affected this immediate portion. But you can see they're open all along here. And Hitler, remember, had his birthday, 56 years of age. And I, you know, I remember saying at the time, I said, you know, for a 56-year-old, I would have expected more closure at this point. Um, doesn't prove, it doesn't say, you know, but I had my suspicions that something was a little, wasn't what I expected. But there's a great deal of biological variability. Some people fuse early, some people fuse late. And so there's no real standard cutoff date, you know. So I figured, well, maybe he... He, he's just a late fuser. He's a late fuser. <laughs> but then I also noticed that the, the, the skull itself was, it was small. It wasn't very large. And the, and, the, and the thickness of the cranial vault was rather thin. Now I point that out because when we have what is called in our species, a, when it comes to skeleton, skeletally, what's called a sexual dimorphism. Sexual, male, female, dimorphism two forms. Males tend to be larger, bigger, can't tell by me, but they <laughs> tend to be. And, and, and women tend to be smaller, more gracile. Uh, you could see it in athletics, the differences between men and women's teams. Uh, and so what ends up happening is men tend to have more bone density. They have, tend to have tuberosities that are larger in terms of muscle attachments. And, you know, the bones are thicker. These were, these were relatively thin. And, you know, I looked at this, and, and I remember saying to someone, if I were, if I had been called in by the Connecticut State Police on this, uh, and I had to give an identification, I would have said, we're looking at a 30 to 40 year old adult woman that was shot either purposely, uh, you know, suicide or, or killed, uh, you know, with a gun wound coming out the back. And she was either in a car fire or a house fire or something like that. That's how I would have identified it. But you know what? Again, 
There's biological variability. There are small men like me. And so there are, you know, that doesn't, this doesn't prove anything or doesn't say anything that I can say this is not Adolf Hitler. I can make suggestion, but in the range of biological variability, you know, I can't, I can't be sure, you know, but I have my suspicions at this point. Um, they also brought out sections of the, of the sofa that they had actually brought back to Moscow, uh, to the Federation, uh, and there was textile and some of the wood from the sofa that he had killed himself on, and they had bloodstains on them. So one of the things I wanted to do was to actually do some DNA sampling. Um, and I wanted to be able to take a, a fragment of, uh, you know, just a tiny fragment um, to be able to, 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 to do DNA. But they told us clearly we could not damage this in any way. Can't even take the most minute sample. However, when they brought this out to me, um, it was in a Rolodex container. You know, the old Rolodex, we don't use them anymore, right? That little plastic container, that's what it was in. And so as a result, you know, it kind of got jostled around. And as a result, Little bitty fragments started, had it exfoliated. <laughs> so I said, can I take those exfoliated, you know? And uh, so we were able to take those. And, you know, uh, so I was able to take those without any damage. The damage had already been done. I was just taking what had exfoliated off the, the, the wall. And then they, they brought out, you know, again, the, the, this is the sofa. This is the arm of the sofa. You can see blood stains are here. I wanted to snip. Um, um, I wanted to snip part of a, a portion of the textile to bring that back to the labs for DNA. They would not allow that at all. Um, but they said we could swab it. So you've seen CSI. So there I am with my gloves and my distilled water. I've got my uh, Q-tips, if you will. My, and I'm swabbing as much blood as I can get onto that from the textile, but also from the wood, too. I took a number of samples as, as best I could. Um, now, i got to tell you guys. I'm an archaeologist. I deal with bones. I don't often get to deal with blood or anything like this. So I, you know, I had my doubts whether I was even my procedures were okay and so forth. But anyhow, it, it turned out that it was all right because I brought the. Oh, I got to tell you this story. I bring, so I, I, I fly back. I, I run to uh, Dr. Strasbaugh, Linda Strasbaugh's uh, laboratory for applied genetics and te technology, and I want to get these samples in the freezer right away got to get them in the freezer right away. So I get there into her office, and she's not there. She was uh, away uh, at a meeting off campus, and, um, but her, her, her administrative assistant was there. And I came in, and I said, you know, we got to get these samples, uh, you know, in the freezer right away. I explained what it was and so forth. So Linda came back about two days later, and she comes into her office, and her secretary says, Nick was here, and he brought Hitler with him. <laughs> And she's like, oh, no, what did he do now, you know? I've been known to get myself in some trouble. But anyhow, um, she took it out and uh, started to process those, uh, those two sam those samples that I brought back. The problem is this. Um, burnt bone is a geneticist nightmare. To get burnt DNA from burnt bone is not easy. And um, the blood samples I got were relatively weak. However, um, one of the markers, you get in DNA, you get a series of markers, okay? You get a series of markers. Um, the better the DNA, the more markers. The more markers, the better the identification, okay? The problem we had was we could only get from those samples a few markers. Uh, in fact, uh, Linda called me, uh, when they got the results, she called me and she said, she called me at my office across campus, and she said, Nick, you've got to get over here right away. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I screwed up. You know, I hung up the phone. I said, the, the samples aren't good. I know she's going to give me heck. And I know this didn't come out. And so I kind of hang my head and go to her lab. And that's when she and her students pulled up the data. And the marker was that the cranial vault fragment was, in fact, a woman. OK. Um, so he changed his sex? <laughs> Will we be allowed in a restaurant? <laughs> hey, he's a strange guy. In more ways than one. Uh, the blood stains turned out to be both male and female. So there's a combination. So 
Could the bloodstains be Ava, uh, you know, and him, uh, possibly? Uh, here's a problem, though, with these markers. The markers are very weak. We, we realize right away, sex is one of those easy markers to get in DNA, okay? It, it doesn't take much, and you could, you could usually do it. Two problems. Number one problem is, you know, uh, burnt bone. Number two problem is, a lot of people touched this thing in the last, not 80 years, whatever it was. And if you know anything about that, is you can contaminate the sample with your own DNA by touching it, breathing on it. When I work on, on cases uh, with, with the state police and so forth, we wear masks and surgical gloves. Because, you know, uh, we don't want to find out that uh, after doing this work that, you know, Hitler was from Italy because then I'd be in a lot of trouble. You know? <laughs> so, our samples weren't good, um, and they could have been contaminated. However, this is what was yielded, uh, that they, it was, the cranial vault was. And it kind of matched up my observations, uh, you know, uh, gross morphological observations uh, when I was there. So the question is, did he escape? Um, and the thing is, I have to admit, we do not have any forensic information, a, a data. That, that, how, and that keeps this thing persistent, I suppose. But the fact is that, remember, in Moscow, they still have that jaw somewhere. And the jaw would be great to get DNA from, because what we usually do is, if there's a molar that is preserved, the DNA in your tooth is in your pulp cavity in the interior, protected by the enamel. So what ends up happening is we could drill through that, and that is not likely to be contaminated. It's not likely to, it's, it's primary genetic data. Um, so um, what we need is for the Russian government to allow their pathologists, they don't need gringos to come over there, they have their own capabilities. They need to allow them to do the analysis and really determine what happened uh, in Germany there. Um, we talked about this before. I do not believe that the Goebbels would have committed suicide had they not absolutely knew and seen, most likely, the bodies. Because they, they would have never killed their kids if they thought Hitler had lied. And if Hitler escaped, he would have wanted Joseph with him. Because at this point, Joseph's the only one he trusts. Everybody else has deserted him. Joseph's right there with him. If he was going to start over again or go somewhere, he would have wanted Joseph Goebbels with him. Joseph Goebbels kills himself because he knows Hitler is dead. Circumstantial. But it's pretty powerful, I think. Um, so, the other thing. The vault fragment was found a year later, and I emphasize that for a couple of reasons. We work in archaeology, and you've seen discovery and all that stuff. You know, we're very meticulous. We record horizontal and, and vertical provenience. Of, we measure constantly, because the only way we can interpret what we find archaeologically is through the association, the context it comes out of, that it's not disturbed, but also what artifacts are with it. And that's how we interpret human behavior from the past, of the past, from what, the work we do. This wasn't done archaeologically. They put a shovel in the ground and they just, you know, they, they just dug this thing up. And let's face it, a lot of people died in that Rice Chancery Garden. There's easily probably 60 to 80 people were killed there. Um, um, you know, is it Ava? Well, you know what? Ava fits forensically. She fits forensically, but we have no historic archival data that suggests that she was, in fact, shot through the head like that. Could have had, maybe it happened, but we don't have any evidence of that. She does fit forensically. She doesn't fit historically in terms of the, the, the data we have. Is it Magda? You know, Magda, I'm sure you guys, you guys all know, she was in love with Hitler. She loved Hitler. Uh, and she was very jealous of Ava Braun. Um, and was very upset, I'm sure, when they married at the end. No. Um, no. In fact, uh, Joseph was quite a philanderer. He was, you know, he had girlfriends all over the place. And um, a, uh, Magda wants to divorce him because of, I mean, and when Hitler finds out, he says, "You cannot divorce. You know, my proper 
propaganda minister, this won't look good to, to the people. You must stay together. And she stayed with him only because of Hitler. But it wasn't a good marriage. Uh, but could it be her? She's a little bit older than Ava, but she could be a possibility too. We know she was killed in the Rice Chancellor Garden, buried and burned. Okay? Again, the context that they found that skull plate is not good. We don't have the records. We don't have, you know, um, exactly where it was found. And um, um, there are, and it doesn't have to be Magnum. It doesn't have to be Ava. It could be somebody just, we don't know in history. It doesn't always have to be somebody famous. It could be somebody that we just don't know that was there. Um, but these are obviously the two most likely candidates from the historic one. When, uh, when, it, when this, the, the film came out and so forth, and oh man, I got, and by the way, I'm sure you guys know that uh, the History Channel has shown this continuously since 2009. And I know every time they show it, because I get emails from all over the place when it comes out. Uh, but uh, one email I did get uh, was from a, a retired Detroit policeman who was with Eisenhower's uh, uh, troops, came into Bavaria, went up to uh, the crow's nest, uh, the eagle's nest rather, and he told me the story that he went into uh, a room uh, in this huge compound, uh, this huge fortress, and it was like a medical room. There was dentist chairs and there was all kinds of, you know, doctor things and so forth. And he found a handkerchief embroidered A-H with blood on it. Again. Hitler had bad teeth, and it could be blood from, uh, you know, his bleeding gums. Uh, uh, and he offered this to compare, and I told him, hold on to it. Um, again, our samples aren't strong enough to compare the two to have enough markers to make a positive identification. That's what we lack. Um, also, uh, um, I heard from a woman from um, um, California who is a lateral cousin descendant of Ava Braun, and she offered to give us a swab of her DNA if it would be helpful to the investigation. Um, again, um, I had to emphasize that we need new samples in order to be conclusive about this. We need new samples. And um, until that happens, we're going to, you know, it, it's unfortunately not going to have the specific answers that we want. So um, the mandible is there. The mandible is key. Because that mandible, if that skull plate is in fact a woman and not Adolf Hitler, that mandible is the last physical evidence of it. And that is the evidence that could finally tell us what happened uh, in uh, um, April and May of 1945. Um, I am totally convinced that the forensic data is there. If the scientists can get to it, we can know what happened uh, uh, back then conclusively. They didn't have that data before, and unfortunately the Soviets destroyed as much as they could. But from what I understand, that mandible is still there, and if access could be given, collaborating with Russian scientists today, we could really, really tell the story. No theories, no ideas, no circumstantial evidence, physical forensic evidence. It's there, if we can get that. And of course, it's, it's probably not going to be forthcoming for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, because of political intrigues, but also, you know, you need, I guess we all need to appreciate um, what went on then. Um, over 20 million Russians died in the Second World War. It was a, Eastern Europe was a bloodbath, and the sensitivities are still there. A generation isn't gone, and they remember, and um, it's maybe just not the right time. It may take a uh, a uh, couple more, more, but at some point that data will come out, it'll be processed, and we'll all know one way or the other what happened back then. I think that's my last slide. So with that, so, you guys know far more than I do uh, about all of this. Uh, but, um, you know, I was involved in a, in, in a case, in a kind of a case that even though it got a lot of, like Rich said, was literally turned out to be an international story, um, we understood that our samples weren't the greatest, but also uh, we understood that we haven't solved anything. You know, we've just added to the questions. 
And, but uh, I do believe that they can be solved. So any questions or any comments or any, if I told the story wrong, feel free to correct me. Uh, but um, let's, uh, you know, I'd love to hear what you guys and gals think about what happened and what you've heard and read. I understand, I understand the sensitivity, not, you know, generational. But what would they gain by not letting it out? I, I you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, um, with the Hunting Hitler uh, program, the History Channel has recently, within the last month or so, have made, uh, attempted to make inroads in Russia to get that sample, but they have not been, as far as I know, my last conversation with them been successful. So I'm assuming it's the sensitivity, and it's also probably the political climate. And at some point, that will change, maybe. I watch the History Channel all the time. He's still alive. I see him all the time. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> in fact, in fact when, the history, all the time. when the History Channel first came out, a lot of people were calling it the Hitler Channel. Because yeah. 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 there's so many Hitler stories. So I, I hated to contribute to that. Anybody else? Yeah, over here. I'm curious. With the uh, number of witnesses, German soldiers, did any of them survive? from the Russian camps or prisons where they were put? Well, not, and, all, and not all of them went to Russian camps. OK. OK, and there were, in fact, uh, Minch, uh, uh, one of the bodyguards, uh, he, he was alive up to about four years ago. OK. In fact, he worked with us on the film. I can answer. Um, yeah. His aides. Uh, yeah. A couple of, the key pe couple of the key people in the bunker were supposedly first in the room. His aide. Uh, Otto Guncha, his valet, Heinz Linga, his driver, Eric Kemka, all participated in bringing the bodies up. And when they were captured by the Russians, after a week, they were brought to help identify, to try and identify the body. They were brought back to the uh, bunker. Then they were put in Soviet prisons and interrogated and beaten till they got a story to more or less fall into the lines of what they wanted to hear. Of the people that were beaten and interrogated, um, Otto Guncha and Kempka more or less stuck to their same story. Heinz Linger was labeled a little bit unreliable. He would change his story as, they, as he was beaten. Right. So, you know, that's, that's that. But they have some decent evidence as to uh, what they believe happened uh, based on, you know, what the aides said. And to tell them the story about he missed. Yeah. Yeah. Miller and I, uh, we're in Berlin, and we met um, an, uh, a soldier whose father was in the Luftwaffe, and he was doing work for the German government, and he got befriended by a number of high-ranking Nazis. And they started uh, telling him stories, and one of the people was Otto Guncha, who mentioned, uh, and this is why, and I'll explain this in a second, why I think this is true, um, he mentioned that he was the first one in after Hitler supposedly uh, shot himself and took cyanide, but he missed. And so he offered the coup de grace. He shot that. Now, why do I think he's reliable? Of all the people that I, I mentioned, Linga, Kemka, um, or other the secretaries, they all wrote books. He never did. He states, that he, according to this person that, that, interview, that he was interviewing with, um, he would light a candle every night for Hitler, and he would, uh, he's, he's kept silent. He was dedicated to the man. That's so he has nothing to gain. He's not trying to gain. He never discussed this. Uh, that's, that's, that's the story he tells. That's he, not in the history books. Does he tell in the story how he shot him? Did he shot well, him? Did he um, shoot him in the temple? Hitler was given advice that, um, by the physician, actually, who gave the, who gave the um, cyanide, Stumpfegger, that if you really want to be sure to kill yourself, shoot under the chin because that way the blast will make you bite the cyanide. And that's what the skull does. Now it's very possible, according to Otto Guncha, according to the man that told the story, he missed. So the blast made him bite the cyanide, and that's why he died. The Russians, there's an excellent book by um, a person, two people, one named Watson and, and the other one a Russian forensic pathologist named Petrova called The Death of Hitler. And in the book, they mention uh, a number of things going on. And, um, and uh, oh, and, and what Guncha was saying then is that he came in and, and you know, offered the, the coup de grace because he missed. So, that was well, that. you know, he, you know, he had the shakes. Yeah. Yeah. He was shaking and, and 
you know, in fact, uh, somebody questioned whether he would have the ability to, the coordination to bite and shoot at the same time. And uh, it does make sense. Was there any bullet wound, bullet holes in the, in the building itself? Like if you missed, no, they never did the a good, yeah, they never, yeah, the Russians yeah, they didn't do that or? kind of forensic. But what yeah, I was going to say was the Russian, uh, Stalin's interest was that uh, it was considered cowardly to take cyanide. And they wanted to not entertain any possibility that he could have shot himself, which was the military way, the honorable way to kill yourself. So according to that book um, by, by Watson and Petrova, uh, the, the investigators did everything they could to just make it seem like he just took cyanide. And they had an interest, like uh, Dr. Bellantoni was saying, about not letting the information out because the Allies uh, were still going over you know, different military things and fighting the war before. They wanted to distract the Americans because they wanted to get as much as they could out of Germany and Berlin and bring it all to Russia. And if they could distract the Allies, all the better. Let them hunt for Hitler. They'll steal every piece of equipment, machinery, and what have you. So, that's Petrovic's. We'll do a couple more, but uh, listen, if, you know, it's, it's hot. Good. If you need to move, please feel free to move around. It's and, 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 uh, you know, we'll do a couple more. Thank you. you mentioned that uh, Eisenhower made the decision to allow the Russians to get into Berlin. Churchill, for political reasons, understood communism much better and did not like that, even though Roosevelt died shortly thereafter. Did Churchill do anything to go over Eisenhower's head to Roosevelt or any of the other uh, aides of Churchill uh, to uh, change that decision? That's beyond my knowledge. Does anybody, can anybody yeah, speak to that? I, I'm not aware of it. He, he made an attempt to complain to Roosevelt. Roosevelt wouldn't even talk to him. Roosevelt knew why. Yeah, Lynn was going to be in the Soviet sector. Because Interesting. it was probably Roosevelt's decision as well as Eisenhower to let the Russians, uh, to let the Soviets stay in Berlin. Eisenhower really, in the end, Eisenhower took the hit for it historically. Eisenhower, Eisenhower took the hit for it historically. But basically, it was Roosevelt's order. To let the, if possible, let the Soviets come. We, we were only, we were less, we were on the Elbe. We were less than 50 miles away. And, and, and the Ninth Army was there. And, and no, 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 Simpson. Simpson's Ninth Army. And in fact, a couple of, uh, this gets off track a little bit, but a couple of uh, journalists with the Ninth Army jumped in the jeep. And they drove right to the outskirts of Berlin. They didn't see a single German soldier anywhere. So the road was wide open. But the order was not; he couldn't go. And Eisenhower was really carrying out Roosevelt's order, uh, not to uh, not to interfere with <coughs> Stalin taking, uh, taking. They had made a deal with Roosevelt you know, between Roosevelt and Stalin, oh, okay. and 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 Churchill probably didn't know anything about it at all. So Churchill was livid when he heard it, and he complained that nobody would listen to him. Go back here. Boy, I'm learning so much now, my, my presentation could be another half an hour. <laughs> uh, you said that when you went to uh, Moscow, uh, that you were and negotiated and anticipated getting four hours. And when you got there, it was less than an hour. Any reason given or any insight on your part of why this happened? Um, you know, the, the History Channel had signed a contract with, with a the folks at the Federation, and I had never seen that contract because I wasn't involved with that negotiation, but um, we were given that, um, that four hours. That's how we were written in the contract, okay? Uh, when we got there, we were taken to places I didn't expect to go to, and we were informed that we had less than an hour and had to be out of there. So what happened, I'm not privy to, but, uh, and we certainly, you know, if we had more time, we could have done a more thorough job, I think. But anyhow, um, I don't know the reasons for it. Um, but after it came out and it became um, a story internationally, the, uh, the, the Federation denied that I was even there. Uh, they actually said, you know, they, we have no record of Tony. And, uh, they probably don't. Anyhow, so. Uh, 
But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know all the, the intrigues uh, at all that, that went on. Um, um, so I really don't know the answer to that. All I know is what we, we had to be out there with. We'll do one more and uh, let you guys stretch. And I'll be around for a while, so if anybody wants to come up and say hi afterwards, feel free. Whatever it's worth. Uh, I'm not going to blame anyone. It's my wife's fault. I, I, the reason why I think Eisenhower won out from my uh, military experience, 201, not 101, uh, city fighting is brutal. Oh. Okay, so he didn't want the casualties. This is Eisenhower. And I'm sure he had the backing of Marshall and Roosevelt. That's a good, that's a good point. So that's the only thing I could add because it was street to street. It's street to street is brutal. Uh, Absolutely. My experience with jungle is different, different. Different warfare, totally. And uh, Fallujah is the closest we come to in Iraq. And anybody, if you speak to anybody that has been in Iraq, it's not pretty. So that's the only reason I could think why Eisenhower stuck to his guns. And he was a, a, a he, he was a, a general's, uh, what, he, uh, what he meant. He was what he meant. Uh, as opposed to Patton, they were fodder. You know, <laughs> Patton and Charles Hill and all that. Thing. That's Marines do. But anyway, uh, that's my. Yeah, my no, it's, from reading and what I know. It's a good point because I have to say that it was street to street, even though they had bombed. I mean, Berlin to I mean, they just, it was rough. It was rough. Thanks, guys, and I'll be around. Come up and say hi. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. And I'd just like to remind everybody, if you're interested in taking a look at the book for uh, the house tour, the book, you know, the, uh, the fundraising tour, uh, which will be on June 18th, take a look at the book, you can see what some of the periodicals are.